glorify yourself and you can reveal yourself and you have to. You have to help us understand you because on our own we don't. So help us um, even get to a deeper level today as we look into um, you coming into Jerusalem to fulfill your mission. So I pray that you would help us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're in a series called Finding Jesus in which we're sweeping through the book of Luke over many, 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 many months in order to find Jesus either for the first time or in a fresh way. That's right. So we're in Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is Jesus coming into Jerusalem. It's a, just the height of his popularity and excitement to the people around Jesus that are laying down those palm branches which was a sign of victory for a conquering hero, they're really thinking Jesus is about to be king, crowned king of the Jews. So it's a coronation about to happen in their minds. He's about to be crowned. There will be a coronation. So let's talk about coronations. Now, when I was in high school, you might not know this. Actually, I forgot this, but I was a student body president, which had a very low ratio of perks to duties. Very few perks, a whole lot of duties. One of the duties was, next slide, was that you were, if you're the student body president, you emceed homecoming. And there was a coronation at homecoming. So come with me. It's 1994. Get your mullet out. You know, spray up your big bangs, ladies. Put on your pump shoes. Reebok pumps. And come with me to the Goodridge High School Gymnasium, 1994. There we are. Student bodies there, some of the families in the community are there, and there are three king candidates and three queen candidates, all seniors. And they're sitting there in a row, and last year's king and queen are behind them, and they're each holding a crown, because they're going to crown this year's king. Now, I don't know how your high school worked, but if it was a particularly cruel senior class, what they would sometimes do is they would nominate two popular guys. These are the all-stars, right? You know, they're great at football, they're super popular. They get the girl. And then they would nominate one guy who was socially awkward for whatever reason, very, very awkward. Because then those candidates would be voted upon by the whole student body, 9th through 12th grade. And the point wasn't that that person would win. No, it was the opposite. It was to make sport of them. Everybody knew they weren't going to win. And just having them up there was hilarious. Now, let me make a side. If you're in high school, I get that popularity means so much. Now, if you're outside of high school, you know the dirty little secret that after you touch your diploma, like 10 minutes later, all the things that you cared about for the last 13 years mean almost nothing. And those people, you never see or care about. It's so hard, though, when you're in the fire not to feel the heat. And so on that stage, that's kind of the scene. So when the drum rolls, the king candidate will take that crown and move it over from head to head. Just hover it, hover it, build suspense, hover it. And you know that this person's not going to win. I mean, there's suspense because you're not sure who's going to be crown king. But one thing you do know, it's not going to be the outcast. It's going to be one of the all-stars. It's the space where outcasts and all-stars meet at that coronation. Now Jesus, as he moves to Jerusalem meets two rich guys. One's an outcast and one's an all-star. Let's look into scripture. Verse 18 of chapter 18 of Luke, first the all-star. Here's what it says. A rich young ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And the rich young ruler said, all these I have kept from my youth. And then Mark 10 adds this, and Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you still lack, so all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, the rich young ruler became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said to his followers, How difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it, this is his disciples, 
said, then who can be saved? And he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So the disciples, they're dumbfounded by Christ's comments here. Because the rich young ruler in his culture is an all-star. He is religiously pious. He is wealthy. He is young, implying healthy. He's also of noble birth. He's a ruler. I mean, he is the total package. And in their minds, a guy like this is obviously being blessed by God. So their question, which just is flabbergast them when Jesus says, how hard is it for a guy like this who just denied what I offered him to be saved? They're flabbergasted because the thought is, well, if, if not him, then who can deserve the kingdom of God? If not this guy, if this guy is not in, if this guy's not getting saved, then who can deserve the kingdom of God? Spoiler alert, it's kind of the point of not deserving the kingdom of God. But that's, that's their question. Now, salvation is an impossible possibility. That's the thrust of this teaching. Salvation is an impossible possibility. Whether you're rich or poor, religious or irreligious, healthy or sick, without God awakening us to what grace is and a desire for it, we don't receive it. Salvation is an impossible possibility. That's what he's laying down right here with this all-star. So let's think about the outcast. Verse 1, chapter 19, just a few miles away from Jerusalem now. Jesus is in Jericho. Jericho is a neighboring town from Jerusalem. That's where he is. He's not yet in Jerusalem, but he's about to enter it. But first he's in Jericho, and he's passing through. Verse 2, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So who's Zacchaeus in his culture? He's an outcast. Besides his wealth, he's the total opposite of the rich young ruler, completely. To contextualize him and get him into our brains, you'd have to think of somebody who is like a crooked IRS agent, really crooked, and he's exploiting the poor. And at the same time, he's selling state secrets to the Russians because Zacchaeus was both a thief and a traitor. As a Jew, he had a contract to collect taxes for Rome, which is already about 60% of the income of poor people, a burden. On top of that, he gouged his fellow Jews and made himself rich. So he's a traitor and a thief to his neighbors. It's important to view him as he was viewed by his neighbors, a traitor and a thief. Also, the Greek word is micros. He's small. He's small of stature and slight. So he's a small guy. Now what motivates his behavior? And his behavior is greed and it's sinful. I mean, it's almost death to a poor person when you're being taxed to that level. So sin has consequences. Because sometimes in Sunday school cartoons, you kind of see Zacchaeus, and he's like an elf up on a shelf. Rather, he would look to his neighbors like an evil troll in a tree. That's what he is. He's an evil cat. In his culture, that's how he's viewed. So that's Zacchaeus. He's definitely an outcast. That's how people viewed him. But how did Jesus view him? Verse 5. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, all the crowd, they grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. So sharing a meal in that culture, it's more than manners. It's a sign of acceptance and connection. That's what Jesus is doing. So he's extending connection and acceptance to Zacchaeus which has a profound impact on Zacchaeus, but it actually displeases all the people around Jesus, which is a good time to talk about treasure. So treasure is whatever you'll pursue regardless of the pushback of the people around you for pursuing it. That's your treasure. Whatever your real treasure is, is whatever you'll pursue regardless of what the people around you who matter will push back on you for it. Right? 
That's a real treasure. Like if you're, fo- if you're following Christ and you know it's a hostile work environment and you do anyway, you must have Christ as your treasure because you're not getting any strokes for it and you're actually getting the opposite for it. But that, that includes anything. So for Zacchaeus, his treasure was his money because he knew he was displeasing the people around him by pursuing it that way. It was his money. He's a little guy. I don't know if he had little guy syndrome. But the thought of, I'm not going to be respected, but I will be feared, and my money is my armor. My money is my armor. So his wealth means a lot to him, just like it did for the rich young ruler. And whatever your treasure is, is what you'll pursue, regardless of the pushback you get from other people around you for pursuing it. For Zacchaeus, that was money. I don't care if it makes me a total outcast, I'm going for it. Money gave him value, it was his armor. Money was Zacchaeus' treasure, but Zacchaeus was Jesus' treasure. Think about it. He's going to go after Zacchaeus, even though doing so, and he knows it, is going to bring disfavor from the people around him, and he does, because he's hated. Everybody hates Zacchaeus, and by association, you receive some of that by associating with him, because Jesus extends acceptance to him, and that acceptance or undeserved favor from Jesus to Zacchaeus has a transforming quality to it. Look what happens. Especially when you realize that money is this guy's treasure. What does he do with it? Verse 8. And when Zacchaeus stood, he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Since he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So Zacchaeus displays unusual generosity in response to radical grace. That's what you're seeing here. Half of your assets, that's pretty big, isn't it? Think of your assets. I'm giving half to the poor today. That's pretty big, is it not? Maybe not. I think so. It's pretty big, especially for a greedy cat. That's such a big thing. That does not happen without something being dislodged here. He's had a treasure transplant. You will not pry money from a greedy person. You know this. Some of you are this. But you definitely know this if you've ever dealt with somebody who's really tight-fisted. You know, the kind of person that reuses napkins. They just don't waste anything, which is a good thing to a point. So this guy, Zacchaeus, has had a treasure transplant in response to the love and acceptance of Jesus. He just has a different mind toward treasure. And he gives half of his possessions to the poor. And then he pays back four times what he defrauded, which is way more than the Old Testament calls for somebody who is paying back something they've stolen. Four times is way excessive. He just has extreme generosity, Zacchaeus, in response to this acceptance he's received from Christ. And verse 10 is like the key verse of the entire book of Luke. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It's also actually a key that makes the Holy Week understandable. Think about Holy Week. It's pretty, I mean, to a person, especially if you're new to it, the idea of Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and he comes in in that kind of weird mixture of both a conqueror, and a humble servant. Because he rides in and people are like, you're the best, deliver us. And the the palm branches were their stars and stripes. I mean, that's a symbol of the Maccabees, like the Maccabean guys who delivered them from from the Greeks. So they're like, Jesus, you be like a conquering warrior king. So they're totally looking. They're saying Hosanna, which doesn't mean yay you. It means deliver us. So they're looking for this political champion, basically, and he won't be that because he knows they need something deeper. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And Good Friday, what's good about Good Friday if it's not the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost? It makes sense out of Holy Week because of verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's what Jesus is doing here. And that's who Zacchaeus is. And he recognizes it. That, that is who he is. And being lost isn't like, I lost my car keys lost. It's not a geographical location problem. It's a spiritual brokenness, like beyond repair. Broken, beyond repair, ruined. 
That's what it means to be lost. We are people on our own that are broken beyond repair. That's the first part of the gospel. And so the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Let's return to the gymnasium. So come back. Come back. Come with me. Put your mullet back on. In the gymnasium, here we are. It's two all-stars and an outcast. It's the king, last year's king with the crown. He's hovering over their heads. Right? I'm there on the stage. You're there in the student body. You have pimples. It's hovering, it's hovering. They're, they're rolling the drum. It's moving from one head to another to another head, and the suspense is building. You can see it. Nobody knows who's going to win. Well, you know who's not going to win, right? Not that guy, not the outcast. Moves from head to head, and he's about to crown it. You know what I always wished? I always wished this. On that year when they did that outcast all-star kind of mashup, I always wished that when it was over, the, he was never going to win, but when it was over the outcast head with, you know, the king from last year moves it around and gets right over that outcast head, I always wished that just in that moment, he had the presence of mind and the guts to just grab the crown, smash it on his head, and run away. I love that. That would be great, right? A good ending on an underdog story where the outcast just wants it, so he takes it and runs away. But if you play out that story, what's going to happen is he's going to get tracked down because he's probably not that fast. And then he's going to get beat down, and the crown that he doesn't deserve will be taken away from him, right? Because he's an outcast. And he doesn't deserve it. Now the only way he's going to get a homecoming crown is if the king from last year takes off his crown and gives it to him. That's the only way he'll ever deserve that crown. Because he's an outcast. Zacchaeus. He's not a good guy. He's a mess. He's greedy. He's prideful. He's not cute. He's a sinner. And in that day, it's because Jesus draws him into this divine appointment that the love is transforming. And now the response, and this is true, what puts an edge on our celebration and what has generosity flowing out of it is when you receive undeserved favor or kindness and you know it. I mean, for think of the, the benefit that Zacchaeus had. The whole culture for most of his adult life is telling him, you're garbage, you're garbage, you're garbage. And guess what? He is garbage in a lot of ways. So he has that ability. So when he receives the grace of Christ, he's like, wow, me? I get the crown? Because go back to the crowning coronation is, it's not that he just grabbed it on his own because he wanted it so much, Jesus took the crown and put it on his head and he received it. That's the difference. He took it. And part of that, because he knows who he is, he understands grace and he receives it. And it's because it's undeserved that it really feels that heavy, good blessedness that results in outflowing generosity. What puts the edge on a celebration of a treasure received is knowing it's undeserved. That's what makes it just a joy. You ever notice this? You ever gotten something you're like, I don't deserve that. I got a really cool gift this week from somebody. Totally surprised me and I felt unworthy and I was like, wow. And it breeds generosity, does it not? If you've been super blessed, you're like, man, I should bless somebody too. Man, I don't deserve that. That's a Zacchaeus story. He's just like, man, wow, of course I'm going to give my assets to the poor. Of course I'm going to pay back more so than what I received. Of course. It's awesome. Grace received, undeserved grace received, always has an outbending kind of generosity to it. It just naturally does, an outbending generosity. When you receive it, part of the edge of it that drives that generosity is knowing, I don't deserve it, which is grace. That was true for the rich young ruler. He didn't deserve the offer of Christ to come, follow me. I want to do life with you. He thought he did deserve it. I'm a pretty good guy, kind of an all-star. That's the difference. I don't know why Jesus came to Zacchaeus. I mean, there's some ways you could think of it. Two weeks later, when all the followers of Christ are super unpopular, and Zacchaeus is one of those, I believe, 
This is probably the guy of all the followers of Christ who is the most accustomed to being unpopular. He's like, yeah, we can do this. Don't worry. I know about not being liked. Don't worry. Everybody hates us. That's cool. I mean, he would definitely be a win and an ad to a, follow, a group of followers of Christ who are very marginalized and unpopular. But other than that, I don't know, besides just the sovereignty of God. Sometimes God does something that's just amazing. And he does it to people for whom you just don't expect it. There's a point in 1 Corinthians where the Corinthian church is getting off in their pride. They're being pretty prideful. And Paul draws them back with this. Remember, before you were called to Christ, not many of you were powerful or smart or influential. But God chose the weak things of this world to confound the strong. He chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So that no one would boast in his presence, but all would boast in Christ. That's really the point of it. Part of the point of what God does is just like, I want you to think, I am great. It's not because you deserve it. I'm great. That's why I moved in your life. I just want you to be an example and a display of my grace. And for people to think, man, God is so powerful. He can work through pretty weak things. So you're in good company if you're not an all-star. If you're not the guy who, like, I can grow thick hair into my 80s and, like, my joints are made out of total titanium and I just make money left and right and I'm always witty and clever and I read deep books, if that's not you, it's probably not you, it's not me, then you're in great company. Because most of Jesus' followers, if you think about it, he had a couple of all-stars in there, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, wealthy, popular. Most of his followers are prostitutes, Blue-collar workers, tax collectors, marginal people at best, mediocre oftentimes. So you're an amazingly good company because the joy of it is in God. The wow of, man, I'm getting included in this. That's how we should feel, man. I can't believe I get in on grace. Who am I? No one has ever become a follower of Christ who hasn't felt that. That's an indicator If you feel like you're doing God a favor, you have not experienced Christ's grace. Just like if you feel when you get married that you're doing that person a favor, you should not marry that person, right? You should feel like you're getting away with something. When Michelle turned 30, this is three years ago, we as a couple are pretty disciplined in our spending. So we're not like lavish people or anything. But when she turned 30, I decided, let's go for it. So I invited, I invited uh, the women in her Bible study and their spouses, and we went to a really nice restaurant, pretty expensive restaurant, in fact, which, again, not characteristic of me. I'm not a big, fancy restaurant guy. I like it. I mean, food's awesome. I feel like you're in heaven. But that's not who I am. But we decided, let's go for this. We dropped some major coin here. And then later on, I began to think about, like, why did I do that? That's so uncharacteristic of me. Not, I didn't regret it. I just thought, like, hmm, that's not like me. That's not, that wouldn't win you points. What did it? That was a waste. No, I just thought, that's not like me. That's outside of my normal, right? And then I began to think a little bit more about it. Here's what I think it is. Because really, when you feel undeserved favor, the natural response is generosity. So one of the things that I thought about, like, why did I do that, that lavish thing? Part of it was, is that... Um, it felt better when she was 30 because we're 11 years apart. So it sounded pretty creepy when I was like, I am married to a 29-year-old and I'm like 41. So 30 sounds better than 29, doesn't it? Like you're in your 40s, but you're married to somebody in their 30s. So I was like, that's cool. Finally, we got her over the 30 mark. But even more so was this. When, when Michelle and I got married, I really felt like I was getting away with something. Like, To the people, I felt like, do you guys see this deal that's working here? I really felt like, I felt like, you know, besides the age, like she lived in Santa Cruz. It's just a beautiful area. I basically lived on the edge of North Dakota. It's like, if anybody's watching this, this is okay. Let's just be, be truthful. It's like the atomic bomb went off, but everybody's still living kind of deal. Like, everything's flat and barren and windy and cold and barbaric. And so her just being willing to not only jump the age barrier, but also just jump the geographic barrier, move to the wilderness and be with me and not know anyone and all that stuff. When we got married, I really felt like I was stealing the sun and getting away with it. It was just undeserved favor. And so the natural response is generosity. Like, 
wow, who am I to receive this? Just infinitely more the idea that Jesus would take my place and give me his righteousness in exchange for my unrighteousness, my honest unrighteousness. Like again, a lot of ways, I'm a criminal. And on my own, I don't deserve it. We don't have to pump that sunshine into our heads to be like, you're great just the way you are. Man, you can go deeper and say, you're not fine. Jesus can make you more than fine in him. Loved, accepted, before you're cleaned up, transformed, renewed. That experience will breed, if it's, if it's healthy and real, a generosity that moves outward. So let's talk about Holy Week. Actions and devos. Next. So those green, green things on your chairs, I know. You may be thinking, that's not what money usually looks like. Is that green wrong? Well, that's not legal tender. It's just a mnemonic device to think through this week. So we have an opportunity in Holy Week. I believe Holy Week and Easter has a unique kind of ripeness that Christmas doesn't. So if you do something unexpectedly generous to somebody during Christmas, like the week before Christmas, they're just going to think, well, you got some Christmas juice rolling with you, right? Like, Merry Christmas. Why'd you do that? Merry Christmas. And they're like, oh, yeah, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It's white noise, basically. If you do something unusually generous that's just celebration and you're basically inviting people into your celebration, that's what you're doing. You're just like, I want, this is so cool. I want you involved in it, even if it's not a celebration for you yet. Have you ever been around somebody who's like, something really cool, I don't have cancer anymore. And you're like, I just want you guys to party. You're coming to my house. You're coming. We had a child born. You're coming over. We're having a bonfire. There is something that happens when you really experience some sort of grace and you just want people in on it. When it happens during Easter, I think it's, it's ripe because people aren't thinking Christmas high. They're just thinking like, oh, Easter. And you have the opportunity to say in their curiosity, why? Next slide. You could say, hey, man, because Jesus wins and Easter is our celebration of it. Man, it's just whatever you want to give to that answer of why. So this week you have a chance, an opportunity. Don't give them that bill. That will make no blessing and make no sense. But it's just a time to think, I want to give this. I want to spend it. Like sometimes God gives us resources. Man, all the resources are transitory, right? Like, it's all going to vaporize. All the money in your bank account someday is going to vaporize. All the strength in your body is going to vaporize. But this week you have an opportunity to say, how can I just bless somebody unexpectedly and let them in on my celebration? And then when they're curious, you can say, well, this is why. They're going to ask. You know you're doing this right is if they say why, either verbally or in their brain. And you can maybe have a chance to say, well, just because, man, Jesus is risen. Or I just... I'm just excited about what Jesus did. Or I'm celebrating resurrection. However you want to, again, the Holy Spirit can give you words. But just to do something. It doesn't have to be money. It can be an hour of your time. You're raking leaves, you just rake their lawn. Or you're at Starbucks and you pay for the coffee of the person behind you. There will be, again, if it's done right, there's some curiosity factor. We have a neighbor who has a rabbit. Uh, Daniel really likes that rabbit. I think we're just going to buy them $20 of rabbit food and say, we just think, we just appreciate your rabbit. And we just wanted to celebrate. Also, it's Easter and Jesus wins, which is awesome. Makes every day better or something. Either we're going to verbalize it or write it down if we don't see them, but we're going to do something like that. Again, what's tangible that you can do? This is cheesy, but it's a mnemonic device. And sometimes you must learn by doing. Just like I had to do that kind of fancy meal, and then I thought, why am I doing this? Oh, that's right. My wife is amazing. Right? Sometimes your actions lead your understanding. And so this is a chance to say, I'm going to spend that that. Uh, resource. I'm going to include somebody else in my celebration of Easter. So again, God can let you know, but if you do it and you pray through it, I think you'll be blessed and so will someone else. So that's an action to do, gospel generosity. And if you'd like to, bring them back next week, put them in the little church building. That's a great way to worship God too and just say, God, bless that. So that's that's an action. Let's talk about devos. So we have these Two different devos. One is for people with kids that are smaller. The other one is for all adults and people with students that are older. This one is a um, art-based one. So I kind of rolled through next slide and thought, found this devo. I didn't make it, but it really works with like classical art or paintings from the Renaissance and before. 
and then also early church fathers. And so you just have one per week. There's six of them, six things. It's just cool to be able to think through art. Art is, God has given us art as a visual means to reflect. And you look at this picture, and it's a picture uh, from the 14th century of Jesus coming in to Jerusalem. It's kind of that weird balance, too, of like the guys in the trees pulling down the palm, or the palm branches, and then also people taking off their cloaks. Again, this is like a Renaissance setting, so it's not accurate. But it is that idea of like, how are people in there who are like, man, they're willing to take their costly garments off and let a donkey walk on them. They had a lot of hope. And, but at the same time, Jesus was a different kind of hope, right? Kind of a paradox. Like, I am a liberator, and I'm also not political. I'm spiritual, which is way deeper and way longer. So you can look at that painting and kind of reflect on it. There's a gospel reading for each day and a different painting for each day. And then there's also a writing from a church father, early church writer. And so that's the beginning of the devotional is that triumphal entry. This is the last reading on Easter. It's, I think, helpful. So the journey's gonna be in between and it's pretty dark. Some of those paintings are quite dark and you'll feel the weight of that, which is actually okay. The darkness of Good Friday has to be felt before the light of Easter is really appreciated. So this is what Hippolytus wrote Joy to all, Easter, joy to all creatures, honor, fat, feasting, delight. Dark death is destroyed and life is restored everywhere. The gates of heaven are open. God has shown himself a man. Man has gone up to him a God. The gates of hell God has shattered. The bars of Adam's prison broken. The people of the world have risen from the dead, bringing good news. What was promised is fulfilled. From the earth has come singing and dancing. That's Easter. Easter's a celebration, right? This devotional will take you through some of the dark to get there, okay? So there's 18 copies there uh, on the bar in the entryway. Again, if you're not into art, totally let it go. If you're critical of art, definitely let that go. I want no emails on anything like this. But grab one. And there's other ones too. If you go free... Holy Week devotionals, you're going to find one. But it's a cool way to really mark the time and say, like, this is a special week, right? So one's for families, one's for adults as well. And then lastly, again, the Easter invite. So if you got somebody in there, let's seek God and pray and just thank him again. It is all a wow. If you're a follower of Christ, I encourage you to do something like that gospel generosity. If you're not, don't do it. It will only confuse things in your mind that you have to deserve God and this is a way to do it. But I do encourage you, if you're kind of considering, what does it mean for me, like Zacchaeus, just to give up, recognize I'm an outcast who doesn't deserve God's grace, but take it because he offers it in his love. So let's pray. Have the worship team come up while I do. Close us in prayer. And we'll praise God for his goodness. He's awesome. Dear Lord, we thank you for who you are, that you work and sometimes in mysterious ways and you draw people to yourself that we don't expect and we are those people. None of us deserves grace. None of us on our own deserves mercy or your kindness or your healing and your transformation. So pray God this week that you give us creative ways to let other people into that celebration. And God, also at the same time, work in our hearts if a person hearing this does not yet know you as Savior and Lord, I pray for that kind of trust and faith that you bear so they give up and just receive your forgiveness and your leadership. It's as simple as that. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Amen. Why don't you all stand? He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted in 